Welcome back to another Tuesday edition, a Tuesday night live stream here on Texas Football. Uh, thank all you guys out there for joining us. Yeah, hook them horns, baby. Everybody's excited. First day of Texas spring football practice. My man CJ Bogle, lifetime Longhorn like myself, oh, was there actually for the 40-minute window. 40-minute media window. All right. Hello, CJ. We got to get into this first of all. The, is it, it, Sark trying to uh, buy some 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 good, I don't know, a little, little good favor with the media? Is that what's going on here? I mean, that also works. The media loves it. They get more headlines, storylines. Guys like, hey, man, I got deadlines. My, my bosses want content. Now you got 40 minutes of content. We haven't had a 40-minute. When's the last time Texas had a 40-minute media window for spring practice? He, he must just be in the given mood. You know, he signs that big contract <laughs> extension. He's sitting back thinking life is good a little bit. Let's let the people celebrate with me what's going on with the program. But, I mean, it was very generous today hey. with his time and what we got to see. We normally don't get to see that much time, you know, normally oh. 15 minutes, 20 minutes max. But that really hey. stretched out. And we really got a, a really good idea of what this team was looking like. And I was cold, AJJ Sports. Don't let them tell you it wasn't cold. <laughs> We got out there at 730. It was about 43 degrees. I was not prepared for that. Hey, a little chilly out there, but hey, I'll, I'll give it up to Sark, man. He, he bought some goodwill with the media there. Or maybe, or maybe, CJ, maybe Sark sees this team and he knows how close he was last year and he saw that team and he's thinking, no, 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 actually, this team's got a real chance too. Yeah. This team is a really good team and maybe he just wanted to showcase his really good team um, he, he was actually pretty complimentary about his practice. Usually Sark isn't that complimentary early on. You got the, you got a chance to see the 40-minute window, just, just kind of broad strokes here. What were your first impressions, biggest takeaways from just watching all these uh, Texas athletes, the new enrollees, the new additions, watching this new Texas football team? Yeah, not too often do you see Steve Sarkeesian kind of kind of blush about his team. You know, he sits there at most times during the press conference and, you know, he'll shoot it straight. We got work to do. We like to improve. Today he kind of came out with a different tone. It was like, yeah, I, I feel pretty good. I think we had a pretty good first practice. And, Rod, you've been through it. You don't hear that too often whenever you're going through spring ball. Most times it's we got to set the tone. We got to get out. We got to get better. There's 14 or 15 of these that we've really got to take advantage of. No, Sarkeesian kind of sat back a little bit with a little smirk on his face and was like, yeah, you know what? We got some guys. And I That's think that was what really stood out to me today is, you know, when you walk across this practice field at position to position, there's guys everywhere. On the defensive side of the ball, you have big-time playmakers with maybe the exception of defensive line, but there are bodies there. But you can look at the defensive edge spot and say, wow, you know, Zeno, Umio Zulu, and Colton Vosick look tremendous. And they're not expected to be in that top four, maybe even top five rotation right now. Like that's that's remarkable. And then you look back at safety and you're like, okay, so Texas added Andrew Makuba, Xavier Phil Samee, and already have Derek Williams in the fold with Michael Taft leading the leading the show. Like, okay, now that's really coming together too. And of course, the offensive side of the ball with the running back stealing the show. You have two of the top quarterbacks in recent history to come out of the high school ranks on campus as well with Trey Owens looking very, very solid today in his first practice as well. So, I mean, it just went from station to station to station of, uh, of positions. And the takeaway was, yeah, they, that group can play. And that, that group is going to be big time contributors for this team. I, I thought there was a lot of talent. There's a lot of NFL talent here that can be produced and developed over the years. I think you're right, Rod. I think Sarkeesian's sitting back a little bit and thinking, we we got ourselves a pretty special ball club right now. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, it, and I think, you know, even coming in, this this uh, coaching staff, they have started – they they recruited things that they know they can't coach. Sark loves speed. Can't coach speed, he brings in speed. You know, uh, Kyle Flood, the big humans, right? They want big humans. Did you see that? Was that also on display – just bigger, more massive human pe human beings, bigger athletes out there. Was the team faster? Because it seems like now Sark has totally been able to remake the roster uh, and remake the roster with his type of athletes. Is that something that's evident and obvious that, oh, man, okay, now this is a, a Sark team. Remember last year Sark said, no, this team feels like my team. It feels like a team that – plays like my team. They run like a Sark team. They they talk like a Sark team, right? They they carry themselves like a Sark team. 
Yeah. I'm imagining this is also the field that this is a SART team. Is it evident that they are that they are also big humans uh, and faster athletes everywhere on the field? Yeah, I think last year really set the tone for what a Sarkeesian team was. And it's big in the trenches and it's fast on the outside with yeah. those kind of hybrid guys that you put at the, the defensive edge and uh, tight end really being able to do both. And you look at this team right now and you're like, all right, Texas is uh, average weight on the offensive line is 331 pounds. That would be second in the SEC a year ago. You look at the defensive side of the ball. Well, you got big Vernon, uh, Vernon Broughton and Alfred Collins in the middle there. Who do you have behind them? Well, you go out and you get Savea out of Arizona, a guy who has over 600 career snaps and is able to fit in with that second unit very smoothly. And then you look at the, the outside, you know, the kind of the shell of the defense. There's speed everywhere with Manny Muhammad and Terrence Brooks. You add Kobe Black to that bit mix uh, with Ro Warren Roberson as well. More speed back deep, really where speed was your kind of biggest weakness a year ago. I mean, adding Andrew Makuba and Xavier Phil Smee and Jordan Johnson Rubel to that matter, it only helps your athleticism back deep. And I tell you what, on the offensive side of the ball, the speed just jumps at you. When you look at Matthew Golden, who we've not really talked about in that same breath as an Isaiah Bond. Today, I was really impressed with what I saw from Ryan. Uh, uh, sorry, with uh, Matthew Golden on top of Ryan Wingo, who came in and was probably the star of day number one. Uh, the play that he made as we were walking off the field, uh, kind of going against uh, on air, he made a, a, a tremendous, you know, leaping catch over the middle of the field. He is going to be uh, a, an issue for opposing defenses this year. And again, you just feel the, the big bodies up front and the speed on the outside. That's the mold that we see from Steve Sarkeesian. And, again, it's going to be no different than what we saw a year ago. Okay. You brought up the receivers. I'm glad you did. I think we got to start there because from the things that I heard from people I trust, um, I think we need to start at the receiver position and we'll work our way around. I know you guys got a lot of questions, so please send in your super chats, send in your questions. We'll put them at, at the top priority. Interrupt the show anytime you want to. We'll get into some of that. Also, uh, my man CJ is going to break down some of the – they're not starters already, but at least who went out with the first team. And as a matter of fact, if you want some of the details on that, go to ontexasfootball.com. My man CJ already wrote it up. You're working hard for y'all, man. He already wrote it up, what he's got. You can go to ontexasfootball.com right now. You can pull it up on your phone while you're watching this right now and already get the article. You can already be uh, in the know from my man, CJ, so we appreciate that. Before we get deep into it, though, uh, we got to thank our, our sponsors. For those of y'all still living in Texas and in the uh, major cities with deregulated electricity like Dallas and Houston, you understand that the deregulated electricity market can be confusing. Of course it can. Texas Electricity Ratings is a shopping website site that lets you compare prices, read customer reviews, and find a good electricity uh, that fits your needs, all right? We're talking about something that can be, uh, give you more bang for your buck. We're talking about value here, folks. So it also filters out all of the uh, the gimmicky plans on websites uh, like Power to Choose that trick customers into expensive bills. You won't get any of that. They're trying to uh, make sure that you get the best value out there. So if you're in the market for a new electricity plan, shop TexasElectricityRatings.com com slash OTF. That's Texas Electricity Ratings.com slash OTF for all of your electricity needs and hook them. So uh, thank you to Texas Electricity Ratings for their support. All right, CJ, uh, before we get into some questions, I say we start at wide receiver. My hypothesis to start the offseason for Texas was the wide receiver room is so deep that Sark will be forced to expand his circle of trust. Yep. of wide receivers. We know he's got a tight circle uh, that of wide receivers. Usually it's three, maybe four guys uh, who end up getting into the, the wide receiver rotation. I thought this year he might have to expand it to five. Hell, yep. you may get more, you may get six, depending on how everything works out. Silas Bold is not even on campus yet. But when I hear you talk about looking at Matthew Golden, which I'm going to give you a floor in just a second, but you talked about Ryan Wingo already, different type of athlete. Um, I had, you know, I was talking to somebody about watching Ryan Wingo and the term that I thought about just listening to the description was location acceleration. Location acceleration is when a wide receiver locates the football and then is able to hit another gear. <laughs> once locating the football in the air. They think they run it. You think they run in full speed. Don't hear another gear that he's got location acceleration, something like A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy both had that. Uh, but I digress. CJ, do you think that my hypothesis will prove to be correct? In yeah, oh, 
expanding his circle of trust of wide receivers. How many wide receivers do you think now in our overreaction uh, edition of the Tuesday night live stream do you think are going to be in the Sark rotation coming up this season now? I think you could set the over under at five and a half, and I would see the argument either way. And I say that <laughs> because I feel comfortable now about DeAndre Moore. You know, he oh. was the first guy out there today at practice. He was well, well before any of the specialists. He was out there. You know, I don't think he was a jugs machine, but he did have someone throwing him passes out in the wide receiver area of the practice field. And then you see him run his routes, and you think, yeah, a guy in year two is supposed to make that jump from a year ago where he did not receive a catch. If you if you play as many snaps as DeAndre Moore did, which I believe was right around 100, and not receive a catch, I, I know what you're thinking all offseason is, i got to get me one, and i got to make a, an impact immediately next year on the field. That's DeAndre Moore right now, and you could tell – you know, that had been eating at him a little bit. This is a guy that came from a great program out in California and coming to Texas, taking that leap across the country. I, I, I know he wants to put back on for the folks back home who are watching him week by week thinking, you know what, did he make the right decision coming to Texas? What he did today and what he's been doing in this offseason leads me to think this group is going to be larger than we expect. And that's very rare, especially from what we saw a year ago because Texas just did not rotate last year. Now I think when you look at the transfer wide receivers, you're going to have Isaiah Bond, Matthew Golden, and Silas Bolden. That's three right there that are coming in expecting to play. Jonte Cook, a fourth, second-year guy, kind of the incumbent, the older guy in the room. He's going to be a, a problem as well. You had DeAndre, DeAndre Moore. Oh, and then we just talked about Ryan Wingo, who was, uh, to our point, Rod, one of the you know most special freshmen on the field today so i i have a hard time seeing that number stay below five but at that same point history kind of proves sarkeesian likes to keep his guys on the field whenever he can because that's what he believes gives texas the best opportunity so i'm i'm, I'm interested to see how the rest of it goes i will say we talked about that that unofficial depth chart you know when the offense is together in the early parts of practice and they're kind of running through the plays at about 70 percent or whatever it might be that first unit wide receiver was Isaiah Bond, uh, mm -hmm. John T. Cook, and DeAndre Moore in the slot. So that's something to monitor there. Your second unit, if you're able to trot out a guy with 1,000 career yards and you know 14 touchdowns or whatever it is, and Matthew Golden plus a five-star in Ryan Wingo, I mean, that's pretty pretty talented as well. Uh, uh, Ryan Niblett actually ran in the second unit as well. So there's a lot of speed there when you consider what's going on in that second unit. Again, this is just to start – day one of spring football. All of this is fluid at the moment. I'll touch a little bit on what we saw from the starting units because there weren't any transfer guys. That will change, okay? This was yep. day one, and Rod, you know it best. I mean, you got to come in and earn your stripes if you want to be an eventual starter at Texas. And right now, I think Sarkeesian's kind of laying that, that law down just a bit right now. Well, except for Bond, right? Except for Bond, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> No, trust me, I get it. I, I was in that like with some guys, they they're built different, they're treated a little bit different. So yeah, Isaiah Bond, he probably gets he gets the benefit of the doubt. And I think we all would give him the benefit of the doubt. But you're right, for the other guys, it's gonna be interesting because I'm hearing great things about Matthew Golden and how he looked, man. He looked explosive. Hey, uh Jerry Hamilton joining us right now. What's going on, Jerry? How you doing, brother? Hey, Rod. Ryan Wingo might test your cover skills back in the day. See, see, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I love it. About that. Hey, so let me ask you this, and I'm not comparing him. What made Roy Williams different? Uh, no, no, that's I'm glad you you brought that up. I've actually made that comparison on this channel before on this platform. I've said he, he reminds me of Roy Williams just watching him, and it's not their playing styles really, and not even I mean their body types I guess could be considered similar because uh, they were bigger wide receivers, but just the combination of size and speed. The combination of size and speed like that, that is as a as a defensive back, usually the bigger wide receivers, they don't have change of direction, short area quickness. They're not they don't have burst a lot. Of, they don't have elite acceleration and speed. But when you when they do, it's a problem. It's a big problem. 
And that's what Ryan Wego presents to a defensive back. But about Roy, Roy was that combination, Jerry. And about Roy was just a, a you know, he was just a freak of an athlete. I mean, he, he was really was. Athlete, yeah. Yeah. Track. I mean, there's it go, go, you know, you can go Google some of this stuff about track. I mean, he was an elite track athlete I, on a basketball court. I mean, he was one of those guys that could go in Gregory Gym and school everybody on the basketball court. And he was a football junkie. That's also that people didn't realize about Roy. Roy didn't go out. He was one of those guys that didn't go out very often. Like he didn't start going out and having a good time party until he was with the Detroit Lions and I was with him with the Lions. When I was with him with the Longhorns, he didn't go out. He didn't, he wanted to stay in and play Madden and, you know what I mean, and, and draw up plays on the dry erase board in, in, in Sims' dorm room. Like he was that dude. That's that's what Roy that, – Roy was a football junkie. So that also helped him too, he, in addition to being a freakish athlete. But he had elite acceleration. And he had something that I think – I was just I just described this term and brought it up with my man CJ here. Location acceleration. Um, when the ball's in the air, guys hit a different speed. That's it. And you think they're running full speed as a defensive back. You're like, I got this guy covered. It's good, baby. I'm good. I'm running good position. And the beat locates the ball, and then he hits another gear. And you go, what? I, I was in – I was in – and they, they – they <laughs> that's what that's what Bobby and I saw today. I, I don't know. Yes. We were standing next to each other. CJ moved. We were all moving around, right? But that's what Ryan Wingo did today. And what impressed me is he did it without full pads, not in a game, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like the adrenaline's going, okay, and I'm going to go make a play. He did it in practice, right? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, accelerate, decelerate, accelerate again. Oh, and I've got one more gear when I look up and I know where that ball's going. And I got to yeah. go get it. It, one thing I do want to touch on on the wide receivers, and Jerry, I want to get your thoughts too, is, you know, with this crowded room and a lot of mouths that are expecting an increase or at least an abundance of targets as we've seen with these uh, transfer guys, if there's one guy that could take some notes from Kyle Flood and kind of the work that he's done to retain guys, it's going to be Chris Jackson and Steve Sarkeesian to keep these guys on campus when it comes to the expanded circle, if that doesn't come, the circle of trust, if that does not come, it's going to be, I, I don't want to say difficult, but I mean, it there's going be. to be conversations, you know, that yeah. there's only one ball and a lot of talented receivers here. What kind of challenges does that face for a, a new, you know, a guy with a lot of new faces in his wide receiver room, Jerry, for, for a guy like Chris Jackson? Yeah, Chris Jackson and Sark have a much tougher job than Flood. Because Flood's built it all through high school recruiting. He hasn't had – he hadn't lost two guys and then brought in two guys out of the portal. Yeah, I mean, that's the tougher thing is if you're a high school lineman and you come into Texas and, and Flood says, all right, Trevor Gooseby, you know, and Jaden Chapman, Banks is going to be gone after his junior year. Y'all just stay on my developmental path and y'all battle that thing out, okay? Yeah. At, at wide receiver, it's tougher to say that because you just bring you bring in two or three guys that are going to be draft picks every year. I mean, to have experience. So the conversation's much dip, much more uh, difficult and different. And that's why I said I, it's actually a great spot to be if you're Sark and Chris Jackson, because there it still is a developmental process for these guys. Yeah. And you're going to know at the end of the spring who's truly bought into that process and who's not. Yeah. And the guys that aren't, you don't mind if they leave, Rod. I mean, that's the reality is if they – and I know everybody wants to play. I get it. But if you're not willing to stick with that process and trust Sark and, and, and his staff at this point, they're not they're not going to make it anyway. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that, to me, that's the difference. Yeah. Offensive line, it's straight high school recruiting. Flood hadn't gone to the portal at all. Um, so these guys just know, boom, boom. It's easier to look at that pecking order and say, okay, I, I, I hear what Coach Flood's saying and I see what he's illustrating. Wide receiver's tough, man, because you bring in two or three dudes every year. Yeah, and one of those dudes is not even on campus yet, right? That's, That's Silas right. Bolden. And he's and coming in with he's coming in with a chip bigger than his 5'8", 165. <laughs> <laughs> People better be ready to get after it, okay? Yeah. No, that, I mean, Texas has first world problems at wide receiver, and it seems like they got first world problems everywhere. I mean, uh, wide receiver, offensive line, there has been talk about there's been a there's a position battle going on on the O line at left guard. Um, yeah. CJ and Jerry, you guys got a chance to in that media window to look at the offensive line. The bodies uh, should be looking very different considering yes. they had a whole entire offseason. Who do you guys think are uh, going to be the best five for Texas on that O line? That's tough. I'll say this. I think pound for pound frame, 
Neto's the best looking offensive lineman in the program. I, I, he is blown up. I have a picture of him from the Under Armour game his senior year to now. Unbelievable difference. Unbelievable. He he has the best college built body of any offensive. He's quicker than Hayden Connor, right? Quicker initially, quicker yeah. working the second level. Hayden Connor started a lot of games. That and that's the hard thing uh, for somebody is there is a certain trust factor there. Um, you know, with Kyle Flood and Steve Sarkeesian uh, of guys that have bought in and have done everything they've been asked to do. The whole key for Neto is I was told the last three weeks of the season carried into the bowl uh, practices were the best three weeks of practice he's had at Texas, and it wasn't even close. So if that was a light coming on moment for him and he carries that over, I think there's going to be a real battle for play in time there um, because that's the thing with Neto. It's always been about – you know, he had a development curve, but then the consistency that comes after. Same thing Jure Bledsoe has been going through. By the way, he looked really good at 295 today. But so on the offensive line, if Neto, if those three last three weeks of the season, that practice carries over to the spring, Hayden Connor's got a fight on his hands, just the way it's going to be, because Neto's yep. very talented. Hey, I, I will say DJ Campbell did look like he slimmed. We, yes. we talked about him slimming down. He looked much better at – 330 than what he was listed at last year at 340. I think that's going to help with his agility, uh, kind of moving side to side when it comes to picking up those uh, twists and stunts that we've seen kind of uh, kind of plagued him a little bit early last year. He picked he, he did improve as the season progressed, but now a little bit leaner, but still a lean 330, if I could put it that way. He looked very good today. Yeah. No, yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, it's crazy to me, guys, that Rod, We've never covered Texas when they've had this much depth at the center position. And I know that can get be boring talk, but they have so much depth at center. Cole Hudson didn't even take some reps there today. Yeah. I mean, and he was a second team center at times last year. Yeah. But you had Connor Robertson and Daniel Cruz now. I mean, Texas is legitimately four deep players at center that Texas thinks could be really good centers. I mean, and they're all 300 plus pounds. Remember when guys were 27 and you're pulling your hair out? I mean, right. It, 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 that's one position that's underrated for in terms of depth, but that's the deepest position on the offensive line right now, center, in my opinion. Yeah. And the offensive line, they've done a great job of honestly just in a transfer portal era of just retaining guys. That's right. Absolutely. Now just stockpiling talent. And we we all know offensive line. You got to get guys in the, you know, not every player, but most players. Kevin Banks wasn't like that. He was a prodigy. But you got to get those players in a college football strength and conditioning program for a year in the offseason. Get them in the, with a nutritionist and a dietitian, all that kind of stuff. Wait till they get their kind of grown man bodies because they still have their teenage bodies, all that yeah. with the offensive line. And that's why offensive line development, it is, it's an art. It's an art form pretty much. Uh, not everybody can do it really well, but they're stockpiling talent on the line and retaining that talent. Guys aren't leaving, which means the future looks really bright. There's tons of upside there on the old line. There's no, it's the deepest the old line has been since they won the national title. There's just no period. It's just, by the way, eventually somebody's going to leave Kyle Flood, and I don't know if he'll cry because he can't <laughs> go so long, but eventually one of those 17 kids of his is going right? to leave. It's, it's amazing. Like, it's going to happen, Coach Flood. You can't keep all those kids in your house forever. <laughs> Somebody's going to branch out and, and, and want to go somewhere else, man. It's not going to happen forever. How, how big is the O-line position room? Did they – when they did the renovations – because when I was in there, the, hey, the O-line I – mean, we had some big guys, Leonard Davis, Big Mike Williams. But I wonder if they had to expand that damn room now that they're hey. recruiting such big humans. And they're recruiting a lot of them, like a lot of lot of. I know they gotta, I know they got to have more plus-size helmets right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they did. They did show off the new cafeteria. Taylor Sarles on uh, Twitter today tweeted out the photo mm -hmm. of where we went actually for the press conference today. Uh, it looked tremendous. This was a brand new room that we were able to see inside the Moncrief facility. Uh, they actually had to kick us out right before, I guess, right after the press conference ended, because that's where the players were headed to go eat lunch and, and get their nutrition. It looked state of the art. Um, I'll, I'll send a photo over to Matthew later on tonight uh, to get that pulled up here. But it was a really impressive uh, uh, place for these guys to lounge around inside the facility. Rod, you would have looked at it and, and probably threw something at the wall thinking you 
you probably w- wish you had this one back in the day. Hey, that's, that's how you how you keep a good offensive lineman. Make sure that you got good food, good cafeteria, stuff like that. Hey, you keep good old linemen around. I like that. Uh, okay, just going through, continue to go through the positions a little bit here, guys. It'll get to the Super Chats, too. I thank you guys sending the Super Chats. Continue. To, we're going to get to the Super Chats, and we'll get to some questions, too. So we appreciate you guys. Uh, I Tight end was something that I was a little concerned about with the loss of JT Sanders. And I have heard – from multiple people now that I trust, uh, including uh, yourself, Jerry, I heard uh, some of your reports earlier that multiple guys look really good at tight end. Not only Amari Nye Black looked really, really good, talking about a guy that has some next level speed at tight end, but the young buck, Jordan Washington, yes. I've heard, oh man, that it, it, it's, I, somebody who does recruiting, like, yeah, I, that's, that's one of those guys that we probably should have ranked that, rated a little bit higher. That dude, just look at him like, you probably should have rated that guy higher. He may get some snaps in that in that rotation of 12 personnel. Rod, what impressed me about Jordan today was when he committed to Texas, he was 212, 213 pounds. Uh, or actually, first time I saw him, when Texas offered him. Then when he committed, he was 218. His 240s real, first of all. But what impressed me, because you knew he had the length, he has the basketball feet, and those guys go chase a rebound, right? So they know how to play the ball in the air. Uh, but what impressed me today, Rod, was, Ankle flexion, knee uh, knee bend, hip flexibility. When he came off the ball in a three-point stance and blocking drills, he had the lowest leverage of any tight end in the program. Wow. So that tells you this guy can be a difference maker in the run game long term because he he has that ability. He has that ability to bend almost like a really good pass rusher and get yeah. really low for a six four six five guy. I was impressed with that today. Um, looking at him and Nye Black, the first time I saw, I, I gotta, I gotta be honest. I, it may have been the one rep that looked, uh, looked at him the first time he got down to the blocking stance, he looked like a frog. Uh, so I, <laughs> I don't think that's his regular stance, but that kind of looked funny to me. Um, but, uh, you know, all those, I think all those guys, Jeff Banks was coaching those guys hard. I mean, there is no doubt, but I'll tell you, I heard Jordan Washington get praised twice uh, mm-hmm. early on that practice. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I think Texas, Nye Black, though, Rod, he moves like a wide receiver. That's that's the best way I can say it when you watch him in person. He will he, if that guy doesn't run a low four or five at the combine a year from now, I'll be shocked. He just wow. he's too quick. He moves like a wide receiver, man. And it's and obviously Texas fans know he did because he caught the ball against Texas and made everybody look slow. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Hey, to your point about the stances, <laughs> as long as you can accelerate off the ball, it'll work. Look at Dallas Goddard and what he lines up next to uh, Lane Johnson at right tackle for the Eagles. He, he He's in one of those frog stances as yes. well. It looks funky when you see it from behind. But right. yeah, to your point, I thought Jordan Washington, looking at him, he did not look like a first-year player today uh, in that tight end room. I think the future for him is very bright. Yeah, no, I've heard great things. Um, all right, uh, before we'll get to quarterback here in a second, I, I love that now with Texas, usually you got to start with the quarterback situation. We can start now with other positions and talk about them. Longhorn fans don't lose their mind because they're, they're so confident in their quarterback stability right now. So thank you, Longhorn fans, for your patience. We'll get to quarterback in a second. Uh, let's talk running back, though, because uh, there was some interesting. Okay, let's talk safety on red real quick. How do you look? With the is it two hundred and forty pounds? How did it look? What is it um, look like on him? Does he wear it well? I hope he doesn't punch me because he's not the guy you want to get in the bar, right? Well, to our question, Rod, our, from the trivia night that I should have answered. <laughs> um, yeah, he has a little bit of an old man YMCA basketball player look to him. He's okay. got he's got a little boiler action going. No, he no, looks no. like he, he, yeah. I mean, it's it's not a structured uh, 235, 240. He Looks good though. I mean, his legs. Look, him and Christian Clark, lower body, I mean, look, extremely powerful, extremely powerful. I, I, no other way to say that. Uh, but you know, Savion's carrying a little bad weight on, on that, too, that 235, whatever he actually is. It's not all – it's not chiseled man. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but hey, that, that running back room, when you go six deep the way that Texas does, eh, that's okay. You know, if you want that bruising bowling ball in your room – you can you, you're afforded that you know that luxury with the talent that you have up the top. I thought C.J. Baxter looked great at 218, same weight that he was last year. Looks completely redefined. Kind of mm-hmm. uh, we talked about that armor building up to yeah. today. He he 
you know, check the box there when it came to his his frame. Uh, I, again, Jaden Blue, anytime you see him with the ball in his hands in space, it, it's just exciting. I think, you know, he's one of the most electric players on this Texas roster. We saw that last year. Um, I was really impressed with Christian Clark simply because I think he bridges that gap to the passing game as natural as anybody on this roster. Uh, there were some, some times that we saw the, the quarterbacks throwing him the ball in, in while running Texas routes or quick slants or whatever it is coming across the middle. I mean, he just looks like a nat natural pass catcher as well as a guy that has, you know, uh, I mean, almost uh, Saquon level thighs, like his lower body or not, not quite there yet. But that, he, that, that, pic that picture of Saquon swinging a golf club, I, I don't know if y'all have seen that driving through the ground with the driver in his hand. That's about what Christian Clark would look like hitting the golf ball. I mean, that, yeah, that's what he, he was very point. impressive at Rod. Like uh, he, he's blown up in a good way. I mean, like when I saw him at Bergstrom airport after his official visit, I was like, okay, this guy has a great running back uh, body type from the waist down. You could just yeah, see yeah. Mm -hmm. big, strong calves. Right. Yeah. Uh, but still, ha not. A, but still has a skinny ankle for being a thick guy. It just doesn't look as skinny as a, a, a wide receiver. Yeah. Um, but there, there you go. That, that's <laughs> it, Matthew. That, that's what Christian Clark will look like at at, at a at Top Golf uh, in a yeah. couple of weeks. <laughs> Bubble and I like yeah. that. Yeah, that, that's, that's 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 what the dude looks like from the waist down. You got to wrap some dudes up. Got to wrap them up, man. I trust me. I remember them dudes. Wrap them up. Hold, hold on. Hit, hang on for help. That's what you do. You hit, hang on for help. That's what you do. <laughs> Somebody asked if Sadir Mitchell's four hundred pounds. I don't think he's four hundred pounds. I, I, I don't. I, I'm not going there. I think three seventy two is pretty accurate. Um, hey, and I did want to touch on Sadir Mitchell just a little bit. I know we're going off, but we did talk about, you know, it sounded like Sadir had to take a lap this morning. And whether or not that's the case, um, I, I, I do want to mention, I did hear Sadir has been battling an illness behind the scenes a little bit. Uh, whether or not he was fully up 100% ready for the start of practice or not, anytime you're coming in a little under the weather, that that's probably not the best case for you. Uh, but for Sadir, I, I would like to see him lose 10 or 15 pounds before the fall camp. 372 pounds, though in the picture I, I tweeted out earlier tonight, it kind of looked like he could carry that weight. I don't think you can carry 370 pounds if you want to be as active on the field as you anticipated coming into the year, especially in year two. That's that I think you need to lose 10 pounds. Uh, and for Texas, that would be huge. Again, so it took Tavondre Sweat five years to really understand what his body was like at 360 pounds coming in at that weight and expecting to play at a dominant level, I don't think is uh, something that's suitable right off the bump. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It's a, I know he's a big man, but uh, he can't be the best version of himself at 372 pounds or whatever it is. Uh, he slims down and he does carry it well. Just because you carry it well, I mean, you can play that's uh, right. really well at that kind of weight. Um, and so, how, many, how many snaps could you play in a row if you were asked to? That's the thing, right, Rod? Exactly. It, it's, it's not many. You're not getting past effectively. Pretty much. Yeah, and it's got to be short yardage situations. Otherwise, if you got to chase somebody downfield, they just don't have the conditioning to do it. So, I mean, you're right. That's a good point. So maybe Sidney Mitchell, it will take him some time to kind of figure out, um, you know, really, really kind of know his own body and what his best playing weight is. Uh, that would be unfortunate because that's one of those positions where Texas, they, they, they need guys to step up at that interior defensive line position. We'll talk defense here in just a second. Just real quick, uh, before we get to the Super Chats here, we'll interrupt our kind of breakdown and get into some of the questions and the Super Chats. Uh, what are your thoughts about the QBs? I know you guys saw them spin the ball a little bit. And they, uh, what were your thoughts about the way that the Arnold Quinn commanded uh, the offense and the team? How, what was the body language about it with these guys? Did it look like it was Quinn's team? Hmm. You know, because it's still Quinn, you know, it's still Quinn has that calm, cool, collected yes. demeanor. You know, he's he's probably not going to be that first guy sprinting to the drill that you see. That's never been who he is as a personality. He was that guy today breaking out the team from the stretching lines. He was, yeah. you know, doing his his best impression to get the guy's hype breaking out in the in individual. Uh, but it's still Quinn. You know, he still has that calm demeanor until it's time for the, the lights to come on and the game to really keep going. Uh, I did think it was a great passing day for both guys. I thought that there were deep passes specifically that you could look at and say, all right, that might not have been there a year ago. It definitely wasn't there 
definitely wasn't there two years ago. Uh, Quinn and Arch today I thought had really good days. There were a couple balls on the ground, but more so were followed up by guys in the receiving room doing some push-ups. So I wouldn't necessarily put that on any of the quarterbacks in that in that regard. But uh, Quinn looked good. Arch looked healthy. Arch was one of those guys that you could see, you know, kind of moving quickly from station to station. And I thought Trey Owens, uh, uh, Jerry, we talked about it earlier today on the recruiting breakdown. Trey Owens, when you see his feet and how quickly he kind of gets from place to place, I mean, it, it, it's uh, it's impressive stuff. Matthew, if you can bring up that clip thrown to the running backs, I'll double up on the uh, on this one here. Just quick little you know slant route from the, the, the running backs out of the slot. This is Quinn thrown to Trey Wisner there. And then I wanted to bring up this about Christian Clark again, just how natural he looks as a pass catcher. We saw a little glitch there. So um, it, he just looks like he has, you know, th that playmaking ability uh, in the passing game. You know, a little – I mean, that just looks so smooth, so effortless. I, I think for Christian Clark, that's going to be where he separates himself from this bunch. But back to the quarterback, smooth day all around. I thought it was – I was impressed day one. Much, much better than where we were multiple years ago when it was like, all right, there's – these guys are playing skee ball with the, the, the routes on air. Before uh, we get into it, I, 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 so only thing I'll add on Quinn, got he's got that strength behind his shoulders, behind his neck a little bit more. You can tell yeah. that's where he's put in some work. And Sark said after uh, practice in the PC, hope to get three to five more pounds on. That's kind of what I was told. 210, 212s, ideally where they want him to be by next season. But it's definitely different. He's a stronger looking guy, which is uh, which is important because his health, staying healthy, is the key uh, for Quinn this year in year three. A um, of among all the things we talk about with Quinn, um, it it's staying healthy in red zone, right, Rod? That's the, yep. what the – how scouts are really going to be looking for with him this year. Yep. Can Doing you make it to a season? Yep. And had, had, did you show improvement in the red zone? It started and, and one, off at you in the red zone. No, I totally agree. And one thing that will keep him healthy, and I was actually um, talking to a friend of mine about this because NFL scouts are now starting to look at it more and more, sack avoidance. Yes. It's not a key stat right now where people are keeping up with it, but it is now becoming – it's an old term, but it's now becoming more and more of a popular term. And the analytics have shown that these quarterbacks in college, they're, they're basically pressured to sack rate. It's pretty much the same in college as it is in the NFL. For Patrick Mahomes, for Justin Fields, for these different quarterbacks. So the theory is that your pressure to sack rate – will translate to the league and then, you know, that sack avoidance becomes a big thing. I think if it is a stat, Patrick Mahomes will lead the NFL in it. Right. And Michael Penix was amazing at sack mm -hmm. avoidance, right? Because you got to feel the pressure. That's what I want to see from Quinn. I want to see better sack avoidance. If you look at his pressure to sack rate, he's actually hovering close to 30%, which is really, really high. Um, I'd like to see that that number decrease, and the way to do it is to feel the pressure for him, still keep his eyes down, feel be able to get rid of the football uh, and get through progressions, and he can maneuver in the pocket that way. So that's going to be interesting. I think that's a, a term that you may see when they start scouting my man Quinn. It come up more and more, pressure to sack rate and sack avoidance, throwing it out there. Uh, before we move on to defense, because I want to hit some of these super chats and hit some of the questions, um, to sum up the offense, Sark did say, that he has a lot of versatile players offensively and that they were moving guys around in practice more than they ever did. Wide receivers moving inside uh, to, from outside to inside and the slot to the outside and also said the runners. He said uh, our running backs were also moved around more than they ever have too. to your point, CJ, about these guys having really good pass catching ability. Uh, you know, Sark's building a versatile weapon with some guys who have multiplicity and some positionless ability within that offense too. Nye Black is one of those guys. What did you say, Jerry? Runs like a wide receiver, but I'm going to put him at tight end. I'm going to yeah. flex him. Like, you know, that could be a problem. So he's getting all these guys that present a lot of problems for defenses. Uh, and by the way, if you start doing that, you're a confident coach in what you got. Yep. That's and a great point. Matthew Golden was a guy that was bouncing all around those positions. He might not have been in that first unit that we saw, but as a result of that, he was able to get looks at outside the slot, the opposite side as well. So he was all over the field getting multiple reps across uh, that Texas offense. All right. Let's uh, before we uh, let's get into the super chats here. A palate cleanser from Juan. Palate cleanser here, guys. Uh -oh. Jerry, Rod, and CJ. Will Rodney, Terry, or David Pierce be at the respective teams in 2026? I'll take Terry, and uh, y'all can play with Pierce. Uh, <laughs> look, Rodney's in the tournament. You, Rodney's in the tournament as a seven seed this year. 
They got two future first round picks at guard coming in. If he makes the tournament next year, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing is, I, I know for the casual Texas basketball fans, if you just tune into the big games, you're like, ooh, this isn't going well at all because it was all 20 point losses, right? Um, but Texas is 19th in the country in offensive adjusted offense in college basketball. That is really freaking good. Um, but they got two six five six six guards coming in. They're going to be first round picks. If Rodney's back in the tournament next year, no question. If things don't go well next year, it's in question. Uh, but I, I think uh, you know. Look, I think uh, I, I think Texas is going to have a pretty talented team again next year in basketball. Yeah. Hey, for David Pierce, if you're able to kind of right this ship and get back to Omaha this year, that'd be what four and seven, four and eight with a COVID year that probably wiped your best team. Are you sitting back thinking, oh man, I was really mad in early March? You know, let's get this guy out of here when all we've seen so far during his tenure is pretty positive results. That's my question with him: is his teams get better as the season progress? Let him figure out what we got moving forward. Uh, I know the bullpen's been an issue during his tenure here. I know that the starting rotation, at least right now, isn't where you want it to be. But when you deal with injuries like we've seen for Tanner Witt, that's a big change up, no pun intended, for what you were expecting coming into this season as well. So uh, for David Pierce, I think that there's still time there for him to right this ship this year. And again, the, the man's been to Omaha. The results speak for themselves so far. I know he hasn't gotten over the hump, but he's been to where the magic happened. So uh, for him, I, I think this year he should be fine. What happens in 2025? I mean, we can debate that when it comes. I'm going to say yes for both. But, and this is a Kim Kardashian, Nicki Minaj, Serena Williams size, Cardi B size, but I will admit the the competition level of, of college baseball in the SEC compared oh, to yeah. the Big 12, yeah, it's, it actually, is it is it a larger leap for the baseball program than yes. the football program? Yes, 100%. Yes. Exactly. So that, that would worry me. So I don't know how that's going to go, but I would say because the – the Longhorn baseball program, a blue blood baseball program, essentially like the Pittsburgh Steelers of college baseball. They've had like three coaches in what the last I don't know, 40 years yeah. or so, something like that. It, I'm going to say it's highly likely that David Pierce will be around in 2026. Just because Texas didn't operate that way. Rod, think about what you just said. I know spring football, and that's what people really want to talk about. Yeah, we'll get back to it in a second. Okay. Okay. In the SEC, every year you say, okay, there's three or four really good teams, but after that, eh, eh, they just have a bunch of really talented players. That's what people say about the SEC, right? You, CJ, go through SEC and baseball. That's not what people say about the SEC and baseball. It's they almost the it's opposite. A, it's a, a, a death It's a death run, man, in the yeah. SEC and baseball. I mean, think about – the teams that have been in the College World Series competed for national titles, won national titles. Heck, the, the guy, the coach that was, was at Ole Miss or Mississippi State three years ago was, was, was going to get fired, won the national title, yep. right? So you're talking LSU, Tennessee, Florida, Arkansas. I mean, a, a, you know, just keep going down the list in the SEC, South Carolina for many years, in baseball, Vanderbilt. I mean, it, it, it's the deep, it's the deepest sport in the SEC that Texas is moving into. Not even close. Yep. Yeah. No, it's good stuff there. Uh, all right. I know you guys uh, appreciate you guys. I wanted to get that in. Thank you for one for the palate cleanser. Uh, let's make our way to defense. And I think it's a great way. Colton um, with a great super chat. Thank you very much, Colton, for the super chat. I think it's a great way for us to segue to the defensive side of the ball. So I appreciate your hard work, gentlemen. Are you concerned that the departure of Sweat and Murphy is going to have a major effect on our linebacker play in 2024? Uh, that, Rod, can I ask this question to you? I want your yeah. answer on this. Okay, um, it is it is it is a big concern. It okay, is. Texas, right. well, here's my question to you: Texas yeah. played a little more read and react, right, with their front. What happens if they're more aggressive with their front this year? Yeah, penetrate into the backfield and make plays, right? Penetrate and make splash plays, force negative plays. How does that affect the linebackers in your eyes? Because if you play in a read and react and you're not as good up front in the interior, that definitely is is going to have some cause of issues for your backers, right? Yeah. But if you're more aggressive – defense playing on the other team's line of scrimmage more what does that do for the linebackers that's sorry long-winded verse i just wanted your answer on that one no 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 i think i think you're right i think actually it could help out certain linebackers with certain skill sets especially a guy like anthony hill uh and allow him to play freer in space because you're just causing chaos up front 
uh, in that in that respect, trying to reset the line of scrimmage every play. And if you're doing that consistently, uh, you can occupy the offensive line, which is one that you want to do anyway. So they're not able to tee off and get to the second level on a guy like Anthony Hill. Uh, and if they do, then you have enough penetration in the backfield to be able to force a negative play, disrupt the play enough where, you know, Texas speed should be able to take over and then they should be able to collapse on the football. So theoretically, I think that type of defense actually fits a guy like Anthony Hill um, because I think it allows him to make more plays in space, you know, keep the offensive lineman off of him. Uh, you know, the, the question is, and that's a great question, Colton. If, you know, right now I think your frontline guys are fine. Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton, I think those guys, your frontline guys are good. The, the question is who you're going to have in the rotation. you got Savea. You do need a true – it would help to have a true nose tackle, a true kind of zero technique. They don't really have that if, if Sadir Mitchell is not uh, mature enough. To, to be ready to take on that burden. They may not have that on the roster, um, but there's no doubt, especially a young linebacking core, which they'll have because Anthony Hill is still young and whoever is going to win that job. Now maybe Bender wins that job. Maybe Blackshear wins that job. Then it wouldn't be a young guy, but I think you may have a younger player in that. You know, Leon LaFowle may end up being a guy. If that's the case with young linebackers, you want to make sure that they have some support in that interior defensive line. You're not leaving them out to dry, having to take on blocks and also, uh, you know, be, be a, the assignment sound all the time. You want to try to make their jobs a little bit easier. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, it's it's been a concern. Linebacker is a little bit of a question mark to me. Not so much defensive tackle. Uh, what's next to Anthony Hill? We know David Benda has, you know, shown really, uh, really positive things during his time at Texas. But can he be reliable for a three down guy? each possession. That's my question mark to him because we've seen him come down as a blitzer. He's been effective in the run game. He's been effective in the passing game, more so a question mark, but more so with Anthony Hill in the run game, not having a guy like Tavondre Sweater, Byron Murphy, eat those blocks like y'all mentioned. If you're able to be reached, can you evade? Can you elude? Can you get off blocks? That's a question. We'll get a little bit of a look at that this uh, this spring with the Texas offensive line, especially in the guards that we've talked about are so, you know, I guess physical and aggressive getting to the second level. That's been a strength last year, kind of creating those holes for Jonathan Brooks and the running backs. Right now, the run game with the linebackers is a, is a, is a question mark. Uh, it's not a concern. It's a question mark. Agreed. No, it's a good point there. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Colton. We appreciate it. Uh, stand on the defense, guys. There's a lot of uh, having a lot of questions. Russell wants to know about Sadia Mitchell's weight, and we talked about that a little bit too. But uh, what are your thoughts about how the uh, the D line looks, starting with the edges uh, and and some of the uh, the bigger human beings inside, obviously. But what do you guys think of the edges for Texas and how those guys? Trey Moore being on campus now, Ethan Burke. Uh, young guys behind them like Colton Vasek, you know, um, my man, Baron Surreal. How'd those guys look to you? Physically, easily the best looking group of guys Texas has had since Sark's been wow. there. I mean, because, because Surreal is what he's your four, right? Burke's your three, Taps your three. I mean, Colton Voss, we don't know if he's going to stay healthy or what it's going to, how things are going to go for him on the field because it's so health related, but physically he looks really good out there, right? Uh, the crazy thing about it is, it's similar to Byron Murphy when it, when he got the Texas. Is Trey Moore is not the tallest. He doesn't have the longest arms. He's not the guy that you look at when they walk onto the practice field. He's got he's got really he's he's definitely gotten bigger in the lower body rod. But he's not the guy you go ooh look at that dude right. Yeah. But then when it's time to turn the twitch on, BGO. It, I mean yeah. BGO. He's yeah. got high high end BGO. I mean, Colin Simmons is a more physically imposing guy than Trey Morris. But as a group as a whole, uh, CJ, I thought easily the best looking group wow. of guys at Edge Texas has had. Uh, yeah. and, and there's guys you don't even miss, mention, but I mean, Jamon Taps about 270 now, 265, yeah. 270, whatever he is now, right? So, I mean, it's a good looking group of athletes there. And you see more Twitch with Trey Moore and Colin Simmons. That twitch yeah. has they got to get quarterbacks on the ground though. That's going to be the whole key for those guys this year. Yeah, especially in the SEC when you're going up against those big cornerstone edge ta or tackles on the offensive line. Jared, to your point about the team or that group looking very physically imposing, you look at Trey Moore and that bunch, and you almost think the opposite. Like you know who's kind of, who's yeah. that guy? You know he doesn't right. look like he fits in. And then you see him get off the ball. You see him go through some of the drills, and you're like, all right, that makes sense why this guy has 22 and a half sacks over the past two seasons. So. It, 
I, I guess that's more a testament to what's behind them than what you know we're talking about right now with Trey Moore, Baron Sorrell, and Ethan Burke. Hey, I thought Colton Vosick and Zena Umiozulu really looked like the oh, best, yeah. you know, from afar. I thought they looked like the best physical defensive ends. 6'5, 255. I mean, what more do you want at the edge position? Uh Colton probably pushing 6'6 six, six is at least what he was listed at at Westlake. Uh so I mean, really, really encouraging to see him healthy again with the helmet on. Uh, because again, we've been deprived of seeing Colton healthy. We've not seen him, you know, being able to go through these drills and see what it's like to get him developed on the field. This is going to be a big spring for him. If he can crack that four or five guy rotation this year, you might be looking at a, a really special defensive line or defensive end group this year. I want to yep. mention another thing about Trey Moore, Rod. One of the things that struck me in Sark's press conference, uh, CJ, Bobby, and I were uh, there. He Sark talked about Trey Moore like he could be a guy that transferred in out of the portal and is one of your team captains this year. That's wow. the type of praise he gave Trey Moore for those uh, on the live stream that haven't that seen Sark's press conference. When you watch it, you're going to be like, hmm, that's interesting. That's pretty – He that was very high praise for a guy that just transferred in in January. It, that sounded like a guy that's going to be a team captain. That's a great point, Jerry. I wonder how often that's happened. Well, a transfer for, for Sark at Texas has come in and become a captain of other yeah. transfer. I can't imagine this happening that often. I mean, it could have. I mean, Keenan Robinson could have been one of those guys. Uh, who knows AD Mitch? I got to go back to year one. Yeah. Day one of spring ball. Day that's one cool. of spring ball. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's impressive. That really is. And that's a good sign. That's a good because that's one thing that also is a question mark. Not a concern, a question mark. Sark was asked about it, about leadership, because you lost so many great leaders. You lost your coach, Barry, and Jay Witt, but JT Sanders was a great leader. Christian Jones, Jalen Ford was a really good leader. Byron Murphy, you lost a lot of leadership. But I love what Sark's answer was, essentially. He said, "It's I'm paraphrasing, it's not as concentrated as it once was. It was concentrated like in the running back room with Bijan and Rojo at one point. Uh, the wide receiver room had a lot of leadership, I think, with X-Man and Jay Witt. Uh, JT Sanders was kind of concentrated uh, in different spots of the team. He says now it's more widespread. It's just not uh, – there's not one guy with a main voice that is pretty much the, the main leader, which was Rojo, I think, at one time on the team. He said it's more widespread, which I think is really good. That means you need leaders in every position group. And I think that's kind of what he's saying. I got leaders everywhere. I got I got some in the running back room. I got one in the, in the wide receiver room. I got a couple in this room. I think he's saying I got different leaders everywhere now, um, which is a really good sign for Texas. Uh, so one of those leaders. Player-led, player-led program, right, Rod? Yes, sir. No doubt. That's exactly right. Player-led teams, period. Those, those are your best teams. They always have been. Yeah. Um, hopefully one of those leaders, and I know this young man has told me he's he's looking forward to that leadership role is Anthony Hill. Um, and as somebody told me, he just looks like he's he looks like a, a five star athlete out there playing linebacker, and he looks like a guy that has a Sunday skill set. Pretty much, he looks the best kid. Like he <laughs> looks like the best prospect on this Texas roster at 240, 240 plus, whatever it might be. Uh, you see him run. We saw him run down you know fields on a punt return punt. Uh, punt coverage a little bit yeah seeing him run as fast and as you know as smoothly as he was again this was a guy I watched running his junior year of high school at 227 run a 467 laser at Denton Ryan I mean this kid he he just looks impressive he had another seven pound Swiss frame he came in at 229 last last spring up 15 pounds to 244 in, in one year I hope he stays in that range because I think that's kind of the ceiling that you'll see his athleticism continue to shine. He looks like the best prospect on this team when it comes to movement in, in space at that frame, at that size. He's as filled out as you'll see. I believe he's my first overall pick in the draft, man. So <laughs> I think he was. So yeah, yeah did I just I just gave you that round, huh? I just <laughs> hmm. nice. No, no doubt. I, I expect that to be. I mean, and, and Sark was asked, by the way, we had a question and we'll actually I know we had a super chat from my man Thunder Pump. And we'll get to it. Thunder Pump. Thunder Pump. Stay with us. We'll get to your super chat because we actually got a special uh, piece of audio uh, for your super chat that we'll get into from Sark. But he was actually asked about who's going to wear the defensive uh, yes. green sticker, the headset communication. And he said it could be linebacker or it could be nickel. 
He said it could be the star. He said it could be the safety. So he doesn't, he said he doesn't know either. He doesn't really know exactly who's going to end up wearing that, that star who ended up giving the plays on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to keep up with. It could be Anthony Rod, Hill. Rod, he, he, he kept the idea open that what you said initially, John A. Barron. Yeah, which that means, you, that means you're not moving him to the corner then. That I was gonna say, if Johnny wants to play corner, baby, don't get that helmet with the headset. <laughs> You're locked in. Send it on behind you. Yeah, you want to? Hey, you want to decline it? Be like, nah, coach, I'm good. I don't need that. I'm all right. Uh, there you go. But uh, yeah, Anthony Hill looking good out there. Uh, the secondary. Let's hit the secondary. Uh, then we'll hit the uh, the other super chats and some of the questions before uh, we get out of here. But the secondary guys, give me your thoughts. You guys know I'm giddy. I'm excited to talk secondary Ooh. with you guys. I heard the body types look different. Heard some guys have transformed their bodies. CJ, what were your thoughts about what you saw from the guys in the secondary? Man, Terrence Brooks looks like a – I mean, he looks like a he guy that like lived in the weight room. On arms. He, exactly. <laughs> he, I mean, his whole lower body looks the part. He looks like a track guy in the lower body. He looks like he could run through you up at the top the top half. He looked really impressive. Manny Muhammad also added 10 pounds this off season too. I thought he looked good. Kobe Black has the early enrollee at the cornerback spot. Uh, again, it stands out because you see him in the bunch with the, the, the cornerbacks and you think, hey, that, that kid looks, you know, almost a forehead taller than everybody. And that, that's what you <laughs> expect of Kobe Black as a guy that we see yeah. kind of a fit that mold of a Ryan Watts as a true boundary guy with Kobe. I think that fits where he should play at at Texas is in that boundary. He has the physicalness. He has the length to man that side of the field. He looked impressive today. But going back to safety, and, and Jerry and I have talked about this a couple of times now, but my goodness, you look at, you know, Derek Williams, Andrew Makuba, and now Xavier Filsimi and that trio right there, led by R Michael Taft. Let's not forget him. I mean, those four right there are super impressive. And then you see the fifth guy behind them, Jelani McDonald. You think, holy cow, like, where did these guys come from? It's a totally revamped looking room from a year ago. The athleticism is, is tremendous. Uh, I, I thought there was a, 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 a very good, I guess, base level frame for these mm -hmm. guys in the secondary that you didn't see a year ago combined with the athleticism and change of direction speed. It, it's a completely different looking room. I, I would say Jelani McDonald pound for pound is one of the top three or four looking kids in the program. No, yeah. position, when you consider the position he plays, wow. um, I mean, he looks, Rod, physically on the hoof. I posted some photos on my Instagram of that. That guy looks different than everybody else physically when you see him. I mean, he's got he's got that height with the long arms, with the muscle tone. I, I it's it, it was pretty impressive just when when he was in drills today. We'll see how they we'll see how they do right as the competition. But Rod. I can't wait till you see Terrence Brooks. I mean, dude, he looks like a running back. He looks like if you just said, I'm going to cut your arms off at the wrist and you don't have your 80-inch wingspan anymore, and I'm going to send you to the running backs, uh, he would have fit right in at the running backs. Is he built that thick? He's got that kind he of thick. thick in his legs. He's, wow. he's, he's a legit 5'11", 209. That's wow. With an 80-inch 80, 80 wingspan, which is hey, rare. Long, long, long as he can still run. We're good, and I would like him to start. And maybe this is about. I like him to start getting his hands on receivers at the line of scrimmage more. That's um, a strength. Yeah, and I think maybe that's what he's leaning on. Like, oh, I'm gonna get physical with these guys. I'm gonna cancel out some of these routes at at, at you know at the initial release at the line, line of scrimmage. So maybe that's what he's doing. I hope that is the case. Uh, but uh, I so like that. Ask for my Instagram. It's uh, G Hamilton underscore or Jerry Hamilton underscore one or two. I don't even know. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, do the research. Don't go to the one that's the fake one. Don't go to the fake one. <laughs> hey, Rod, I, I wanted to shout out uh, Jalen Gilbo as well. Back on the field today, he looked hey. good. He looked healthy. He looked like he filled out a little bit up at the top too. Uh, changed directions very well. I know that that was kind of a concern coming off of the knee injury a year ago. That's a guy that's going to find his way into this field like you saw his freshman year where he was very much active into that rotation with Jade Barron and that, that nickel spot. Uh, I, I think Jalen Jalen Gilbo might be a guy that we talk about, you know, looking back on uh, spring ball in a couple of weeks. Like, yeah, we probably should have mentioned his name a little bit more coming into this. I hope that is the case. I hope that is the case for Jalen Gilbo. If you get that kind of depth at nickel, well, I don't know where they're playing him now. They're playing him at nickel or they're playing him at corner. I believe they're he was at nickel last time I checked. He'll get looks at both. Yep. He'll get looks at both. If he if he ends up giving you a guy you believe is capable 
and consistent at nickel, then that gives you the freedom to move around at Jade Barron if you want to and put them in different places and be really creative about uh, the depth in that secondary and the rotations too. I mean, they may start rotating a lot of different guys in there. They know they like rotating the safeties. Um, they may start rotating corners and, and Jade Barron may be a part of that rotation too. Rotating that corner and rotating that nickel, depending on the matchup and the situation. Um, all right, that a good conversation there. And I did hear my man Xavier Phil Samir is wearing 21. Is he, he wearing is. yeah? He is okay. All right, then yeah. hey, that's, I'm hoping I told him you're gonna track his drop rate. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, he already got better hands than Rod B. My hope is that he becomes the greatest number 21 in Texas football history. That's, that's my hope. All right, that 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 Rod B never. I don't even have to claim that anymore. Anymore, I can't. That, I, I shouldn't I can get tell you this, dude. He fills out twenty one now. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> but, I, it, but I will say this: he'll probably end up changing numbers to a cooler number because these yeah. days twenty one is not as cool for some reason. And that was his back, kind of back in my day. I'm an old man. I agree with you. Twenty one's not going to be on his wall when he's 40. exactly. <laughs> hey, there you go. He's going to be some other number. You know it will be a different number. Yeah, but no, we, we, we love that's on your wall, Rod. I'm going to still keep bragging about that. Greatest number 21 in Texas football history. I hope I can keep saying it for years to come. Uh, all right, let's get to uh, Thunder Pup's question here. Actually, no, let's get to Justin Yarbo because Thunder Pup, we have an audio element associated with your question. You're special, Thunder Pup. Uh, Justin Yarbo, let's get to his question because I think it's a good question. Anything you saw at practice you didn't like? Because we seem like we liked everything because it's the first day we're overreacting to everything and we love it. What didn't you like about the uh, the first impressions or the 40-minute window of uh, media availability for practice? To be real, there's not going to be much we don't like um, because we are in that 30-minute window and – there was just sh it's shells, right? It's shoulder pads and shorts. So there wasn't mono e mono physicality necessarily, especially not when we were watching. So uh, you know, look, receivers had two or three drops today, CJ. That's I where mean, I was going with it. They did a few push-ups today. Uh it happens, right? Um, but I, I think that would probably be the one thing is all right, you know, I'm 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 sure Sark and Chris Jackson addressed it, like, you know, let's we, we have four drops today. Let's make it two tomorrow. It's got yep. it now. Yep. That's exactly where I was going with it. I mean, again, day one, new quarterbacks, new new wide receivers. If that's the issue that we're looking at right now, I think you're going to be fine during spring football. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, it's the first date. Yeah. It's first date, first impression. You can't really find anything wrong. It's hey, about it was wet and cold out there this morning. I'm sure those balls were a little slick, you know. <laughs> there you we'll go. talk it up with that. I might have yep. been the only one cold this morning, Jerry. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a little chilly. A little shrinkage going on out there, huh? I uh, wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, uh, but no, that, 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 no, I think it's a really good point uh, that you made about, you know, it's er, the shells. He calls them underwear. I think Sark's got a new term. It's called underwear. We used to call it shells. Shells, basically, you just got the shoulder pads on, the helmets, and you don't have your lower pads on. Um, so he calls them underwear. But you're, you're right about that. Like I said, it's about the third or fourth or fifth day i guarantee you a practice there'll be more for us to uh, be critical about yeah guarantee you that right now everybody's giddy about it all right thunder pup let's get to this question because it's a great one and i i'll give my man cj the floor here because i know cj has actually an audio clip uh from yeah. it and was there when sark actually brought it up at the post game i'm uh, sorry the the uh the post practice i should say uh presser thunder pump can you explain the new helmet mic rules in college football Sark mentioned briefly he's been talking via helmet mic already uh, in practice. Yeah, so the NCAA Rules Committee has proposed the rule change to allow coaches to communicate with quarterbacks and one player on the defense uh, to get play calls in. I, I guess this was in response to the Michigan sign-stealing scandal we saw a year ago. You know, Connor Stallings changing the game for the better, I guess. Uh, but this is where <laughs> we're at now. You know, the communication that we see in the NFL with with uh with quarterbacks and, and and linebackers with the green dot on the back of their helmet that is coming to college football or at least it's proposed uh the rules committee will meet for approval on april 18th right right before the texas spring game uh but right now texas is preparing and i think a number of teams across the country are preparing as though this rule is going to be implemented in college football ne uh, next season we saw it in some of the bowl games aside from the college football playoff last year uh coaches teams players quarterbacks uh, we're able to hear and communicate with uh, the the sideline, the box, wherever their play call was coming in. There wasn't a constant dialogue, so it's just coming in. 
uh, but it does change the way the game is played with, uh, you know, signals coming in, calls coming in, whatever it might be. Uh, Sarkeesian mentioned it today as well, and he spoke about it in his press conference. The team practiced that today. Quinn Ewers and Steve Sarkeesian were hearing each other talk. Uh, I guess uh, Quinn Ewers, again, was listening to Steve Sarkeesian give him the play call and the team situation for the offense, uh, it, just getting used to it. You know, what is it like, you know, hearing the play call in the huddle, giving it off to his team, and then executing the play, making sure that the play is right, that formation set and motions happen according to the play call. It's a little different. Sarkeesian said, you know, play calls uh, – are normally five words or, you know, they can be five words. It's very quick in the huddle, very quick. When you hear it from the, the communication, uh, it's a little longer whenever you see it from the sideline, but as a result, everybody's on the same page and there's no question marks from point A to point B to the team. And then the snap, but uh, Matthew, if you can pull up that, that clip from Sark, uh, what he talked about in the press conference, I thought it was really interesting. Just kind of, you know, what's going to take this spring for those two guys to get on the same page and really make sure that it's a smooth transition going into the fall. If this rule is approved here. A little different for us, for Quinn and I, this year is my ability to talk to him through the mic. And we, and we started practicing that today. And I think, having two years of experience of working together and now having that dialogue uh, through the headset, uh, I think is going to be beneficial for us. Are you allowed What's to the use biggest, the headset? Like, what does Quinn have to adapt to? You've worked with a headset and pros before. What's the biggest thing quarterback has to adapt to? Um, you know, I, again, I don't know if it's just Quinn. I think it's he and I, you know, because Again, the headset specifically. Yeah, no, it's just hearing it, you know, and as opposed to the signals. I mean, I still think he's going to look to the sideline but yet hearing that call and then communicating that with the with the pertinent information that's needed um and i i think the challenge for me is how much information is quality good information and when does it cross the threshold of too much uh to where it's a little bit of paralysis by analysis you know because there's too much information and so um and that's a fine line of he and i working together with some of that stuff he and i working with the offensive line and getting that communication done. But um, I, th I thought it felt really comfortable for him today, first time out doing it. Steve, just to clarify, the NCAA is still a few weeks away from officially green lighting, right, the headset stuff, but you're allowed to use that technology now? Yeah, we, we're, we're in kind of that, that phase where they're allowing us that opportunity to do that. Um, and, and working with the SEC and with the NCAA, that, that – uh, that, that looks like it's going to be a go for us. Do you play faster or slower because of that change? Um, I think you can do both, quite frankly. Um, okay. You know, and again, that it's a lot easier to, to say five words and signal five words, right. but yet you can give more, more information and, and you can have some real dialogue to where you can speed up, slow down. Um, and hopefully I can give him some information that, that allows him to play a little bit faster mm -hmm. within plays as well. Okay. Yeah. Hey, hey, Rod. I thought what was interesting about that is one uh, CJ held that held the camera for like ten straight minutes or fifteen or whatever. So he, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got a little shaky in there. I, I was getting that, tired. He drinks on us the next time, right? But uh, <laughs> the signs aren't going away. Uh, nope. yeah, yeah, we were talking about all the colored signs, everything. They're still going to remain because one thing Sark said at the end of that was, we have to be prepared for both because what if the mic goes out in the stadium? Yeah. Yep. And if you're not prepared for both, you're screwed. You're right. Oh, well, if there's interference and you yep. can't really hear it, you know what I mean? Yep. It, uh, yeah, tr technology does fail, fail us at times. We forget well, the pink Longhorn shirts on the sidelines will continue. Yeah. No, that's yeah. a great point about it. And I love what he brought up about pertinent information because it's for those who don't know, as, as CJ talked about the rules, it's going to cut off at the 15-second mark. And if you get to the line of scrimmage quick enough, and get lined up quick enough, you, the quarterback and the, the head coach can actually communicate while the quarterback is at the line of scrimmage and the defense is already lined up. And yep. like I said, it cuts off at 50 seconds, but if you get up there at 20 with 25 seconds left on the play clock, that's 10 seconds where you could, the coach can go, all right, look at that Mike linebacker. You see that safety at the top of the, the, at the, top of the formation? He's going to rotate. I'm telling you right now, he's going to rotate and be ready for it. We come with the backside scene. Right? You know, he can actually talk to him. That Sean right. McVay was doing that famously when the NFL first started doing it, and then Bill Belichick started sending in and doing the Super Bowl two plays, one prior to the 15-second cutoff, and then they would totally shift something post-15-second cutoff and force Jared Goff to have to process it on his own. And I wonder if Sark's going to, you know, force them, not force them, but at least – speed up 
the, the pace in terms of them lining up. Not right. snapping up, but lining up so that he can talk Quinn through some of the stuff. Let me ask a question to you, though. At the pro level, you could see a, a defensive coordinator or coach doing that on defensively. Can you really do that at the college level? You substitute more, mm-hmm. right? You substitute during drives. How much can you put on the plate of a defense? Can you have two defenses called first one and fifth? I mean, how, that's the question, right? They're not all professional football players. Great point. That's a great point, Jerry. That's a, you, you're, you're right about that, brother. I actually – yeah, if that fails, it's a lot easier. But you're right. I totally agree with you. I don't know if, if college – uh, college kids can handle that because you ain't you ain't got all NFL guys on your squad. Great point. Agree. It'll be interesting to see what how much is if, if that is if we find out Texas does a lot of that next year, they're very confident in the football IQ and ability to process of their defense. That would actually be a really good sign. Yeah, that would be. Uh, th- there, there was one other point I wanted to mention in that press conference that Sarkeesian mentioned was uh, not giving too much information. You know, yes, he can sit there and he can dissect some of these defensives, the schemes, the tendencies that they're giving because of the look that they might have if they get to the line sc- scrimmage early. Uh, but, you know, when you already have the play call coming in and you sit back in the huddle and you start diagnosing things, Keep hearing that little buzzing word in your in your ear. That might not be the best thing for you, especially if you're you know sitting there with a pretty complicated play call already. I, I looked back at that that Twitter clip that kind of goes viral every now and then of uh, John Gruden giving the play call to Chris Sims and, and Hard Knocks a few years ago. And yeah. you know I, I don't think Sarkeesian's offense is quite as complicated as Jay, uh, John Gruden's. Not many are, but you are going to be dealt with at times. You know playing on the road in a raucous SEC environment having to relay that play call from the huddle or from the headset to your huddle and making sure that everyone is in that right situation. After yeah. that, if you keep talking a little bit, things might get a little haywire for your quarterback. So I, I keeping it you know short, quick, and easy is best key for me. CJ, right. you just brought up something that you gave me a thought uh, on this. The biggest advantage to this is a really good play caller on the road. When it's going to be easier to communicate with your quarterback when you're at the swamp and you can't hear. Yeah. You can communicate directly with your quarterback on the road in a crazy LSU at night type of environment. That is a big, big thing for a play caller, in my opinion. On the road. At Kyle Field, that helps Quinn. Somebody, Colton, brought it up. That's going to help Quinn in Sark next year at Kyle Field because that's going to be crazy environment. Absolutely. No, it's a good point. I totally agree with that. Uh, good stuff, guys. Uh, before we uh, get out of here, just give a shout out once again to TexasElectricityRatings.com. Hey, guys, for anybody out there shopping for electricity uh, in the deregulated areas of Texas, TexasElectricityRatings.com is the best place to find a great electricity plan for your household. For starters, it filters out all of the uh, the dangerous and gimmicky plans from providers that are all hat and no cattle when it comes to your monthly bill. You can shop by rate, but also by an average bill feature that actually takes into account seasonal usage to give you a real number and not some placeholder. So if you're looking for a new electricity plan, check out TexasElectricityRatings.com slash OTF. That's TexasElectricityRatings.com slash OTF for the best options available. And remember, hook them. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, final comments. I got one question for you guys before we get out of here. Um, you guys got a chance to observe the team for that that forty minute window, which was very generous of Sark. I think he's showcasing his team, so he's really confident about his team. Uh, this is the, in terms of just the way the team looks and your first impression. This is the best looking Texas football team since. Go. Go ahead, Jerry. My. Um, I've been on the record. Most, uh, I, I'm, this is the most hype spring practice for me uh, in 20 years. Um, I, I think they. I, I think this is going to be a better football team than a year ago. But you're also playing in the SEC, so I'm not sitting here saying you're going 11 and one. I think it's a great looking football team. Uh, I've been pegging the 20 years for a reason. I think this is an extremely fast football team. A lot of speed. Uh, so much experience on the offensive line. I mean. Literally, have three groups of offensive linemen uh, that you would feel comfortable scrimmaging with at Texas. And Sark said it best: 
we have we we look around and we're pretty much too deep at, at everywhere today with the influx of 17 early enrollees and the seven transfers i i'm on the same train i think it's the uh it's the biggest most anticipated spring practice in 20 years for a reason mm. uh, guys yeah yeah, I don't want to discount what that 23 team did. I mean, you were a top four team in the country. You did have, you yeah. know, 11 guys enter or at least get into the NFL combine. We're expecting eight at least right now to hear their names in the draft. That was a very, very good team. Uh, but to Jerry's point, I feel like there's a little bit more depth, a little bit more, uh, at least position wise, you can throw out an extra corner, an extra safety. I think you're deeper back there. What are you going to be on the interior of the defensive line? That might be the biggest question mark, obviously, in terms of whether or not this team sees as, as much on-field success. But what we're seeing right now is very certainly encouraging in terms of what this team could be on an all-time Texas scale, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I mean, it seems like Sarkeesian may be on a run here. He says obsession, right? Obsession is the motto for this team. He's obsessed with winning a national title. Uh, he's talked about that. I think getting close last year, just getting a taste of it, uh, that has really kind of uh, – now he's salivating. <laughs> As hey, Rod, Rod I, want, I wanted to say this. So you were part of the number one recruiting class in the country in 1999. Yep. You got that ball, ball rolling. Y'all had the Gatorade offensive and defensive players of the year in the country and Chris Sims and Corey Redding. Um, and, and a lot of guys in that class, Marcus Tubbs, right? I mean, you just go down the list. This is what three straight top five recruiting classes should look like on a football field. That, that's where I – that's kind of the thing that gets me going is how the season's going to shake out, how injuries are going to shake out. None of us can predict. But right now – I'm just telling you guys, Texas fans, this is what it's supposed to look like if you're recruiting at a really high level. You can look out there and say, man, there's going to be 30 or 35 future draft picks as long as these guys stay healthy and maximize their talent and handle all the things that come with being a college athlete with NIL nowadays. That's how talented Texas is. That doesn't mean they have a guy at every position but one through 85, and I think they're at 85 right now, so four guys are going to have to go home after this at least. Uh, they This is what it's supposed to look like from a talent perspective. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I mean, they're, 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 they're pretty – I would say they're pretty deep and have NFL talent at almost every position now. Yeah. Guys who have who have that ceiling. I say they're gonna they're gonna reach that ceiling. Um, there's always you know, the work ethic. You can't question that. Whether the guys gonna be injured, there's always a lot of different factors. But I mean, you you can check a lot of guys with NFL upside or Sunday skill set at almost every position uh, that the Longhorns have. That is the goal. All right. Uh, thank you guys. Appreciate you, Jerry. You are the man. Appreciate you, CJ. Oh, real quick, I got one other thing. So we've had a couple of basketball questions. Yes, the Colorado right. State, Virginia about the tip off, and they may just have it was running late. It's all tempo game. If Virginia can get you playing slow and get you playing tight, if you want to play a fast tempo, that's where Virginia likes to be. Watch that tonight against Colorado State because if Virginia beats Colorado State, and I'm and I'm not saying what's going to happen in that game, but if Virginia beats Colorado State, watch how they can slow a team down. That if hey. it's Virginia and Texas. That's what that entire game is going to be about. It's going to be about tempo. Texas does not want to play the lowest possession game in the country, which is what Tony Bennett plays. You have to play faster tempo against Virginia mm -hmm. because they're not as good as they used to be because they don't have th those level guards right now at Virginia. But if they can get you into that 63 or 64 possession game, it makes you play tight because it's not where you want to be. Yeah, Jerry, we're we're three minutes into that game. I got it on. It's two to two right now. Three minutes in. Every oh, just like possession. Tony Bennett wants. <laughs> it, it, they've had four possessions. Every single one of them has been under five seconds on the shot clock before something's gone. Mm. So, to your point. Colorado State can't speed it up. Watch how tight they get late in that game. Yep, that's ugly, man. That's uh, that's U G L Y. That's no alibi. I don't want to watch something that ugly. I'll uh, I'll just see. <laughs> I'll see the final score, and then hopefully uh, it's a better matchup for the Longhorns, whoever they have to face. Uh, but Jerry, thank you for all of the knowledge. Uh, C J U as well. We appreciate that, brother. Uh, thank you to uh, Texas Electricity Ratings and all their support. Thank you guys out there for listening, uh, and thank you for your viewership and your support. This community, we love it on Texas football. It's La Familia, baby. It's family. Also, thank you uh, to my man. Matt Matt behind the scenes, Matthew behind the scenes. Awesome. 
He's always the real MVP of this thing. So we appreciate him. All right. Uh, don't worry. Tomorrow we'll be back for another uh, Wednesday night live stream. And we'll be talking about Texas spring practice uh, in the morning. You guys got coffee and football, coffee and football at pro day at 1245 tomorrow. Pro. Oh. At, hey, look, it doesn't matter what like Quinn looked good today. Tomorrow's a big day for Quinn. He's throwing in front of 32 teams. Uh, by the way, Tavondre Sweat and Jonathan Brooks were at the practice today. Um, obviously, Tavondre Sweat, they'll, they'll be taking part in, in, in some form or fashion tomorrow. But a big day for Quinn tomorrow on the football field with about 32 uh, NFL scouts in front of him. Amen to that, brother. Yeah, I, I just to see the way he – I mean, if he's going to be a quarterback, could potentially be drafted number one overall – they want to pay attention to body language, how he interacts with people. You know, is he a confident uh, player, how he carries himself? Oh, it's going to be a lot. I totally agree. This is the first time scouts get that up close and personal look at him. They're not just on film, but get a chance to meet the man. I agree. Big day for Quinn. I'm excited for him. I'm excited for all the guys. So that, so obviously, folks, we got you covered. On Texas football, whether it be about Texas spring practice or pro day, that's where you want to be. Go to ontexasfootball.com as well. You can sign up for the bracket there, right, CJ? That's right. You got to until uh, Thursday morning is the cutoff. Get it in before 11 o'clock, and we got a nice $200 prize to uh, on field apparel there. Uh, not gonna lie, I've not signed up yet, but I will because I gotta have bragging rights. If I if my bracket's not busted, it'll probably be busted. So I'll probably be bragging to no one. All right, uh, thank y'all, you guys out there. We appreciate it. And until next time, uh, hook. Welcome.